the terrible change comes three weeks later. After a flurry of hospital visits, police interviews, and even harassment from the media, things became strangely quiet. He's a broken road. Brian Dubois was a serial killer, with a victim count in the double digits. With all what the murders- What a mundane name. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just weird to hear his last name be Dubois, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if we knew that already. I don't think so. Can't think about it. It's just, it's it's so neighboring Harry Dubois that it's unnerving. Oh yeah, it is. It, like, it, to me, I read that and I think like Cajun, you know, Louisiana South, Southern gentleman style, you know, uh, oil baron stereotypes. Yeah. Dang, that's interesting, but I guess that does, I mean, it makes the voice fit, that's for sure. Brian Dubois was a serial killer with a victim count in the double digits, with all the murders taking place over the course of nearly four decades. Damn. That would get national attention, of course, especially since Brian appeared to be involved in the high-profile disappearance of a promising college freshman last year. Hmm. So he, he it's a, oh, it's the guy from the the cold open. Yeah. Which would have happened after Echo. Yep. So that's pretty promising, at least. Well, I mean, it's uh, not promising. That wasn't the word I was uh, thinking. Uh, it's it's signposted is what I was trying to say. Um, that's pretty signposted. Then then that. You know, they they put that in there specifically to be his downfall, even though that's what opens up the the game. That's interesting. Very bookended. The body cam footage of their dramatic rescue from the mines even made the rounds on social media. Oh, how embarrassing! For about two days. At the same time, a pandemic was picking up steam, and media attention became focused elsewhere. That lack of attention made Cameron's recovery much easier. They were canonically saved by the lockdown. Especially Artie. Yeah. Because Duke got sent home from the bar. He got couldn't go out drinking, so he's dri he happened to be driving home from Peyton right when Artie was on the road. And that's why Artie survives, and that's why all of them survive. Except for Do you Devin. think that Sona's ha for faced prejudice because of COVID? <laughs> Sorry, just think about the about, universe. Nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> speciesism is this their version of like uh, you know like the racial hate spike? That's pretty yeah. brutal. Spike of violence against against bats. Yeah, Micah dies tragically <laughs> in a hate crime two years after Echo. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> that lack of attention made Cameron's recovery much easier. His burst liver and severely damaged kidney left him needing surgery, and the hospital did what it could for his elbow, but his doctors were hopeful that it, with a lot of physical therapy he could at least use it for basic necessities. While it did suck to maybe never be able to bend his elbow correctly, or without pain, what really devastated Cameron was the weakness and almost debilitating tingling in his fingers. Guitar was an absolute no. For now. But what about forever? Cameron had been trying to banish that damn voice from his head. No. The negative thoughts from his head. Right? Things continued to feel strange. It didn't seem to be related to his ESP, because he could easily tell when that was happening. Ever since the shroom trip, a haze of psychic ability lingered around him, allowing him to capture thoughts and feelings seemingly at random. Downloading is what some people like him like to call it. He didn't have much control, though. Sometimes he wasn't even able to tell if the download was received. he was receiving was from the living or the dead. Cameron even began to try and hone his abilities, and experiment with just how much he could do. Unfortunately, 
He figured out pretty quickly that without an illicit substance of some kind to fuel his clairvoyance, it was extremely hard to do. That, or being in an active location. Echo is one of those locations, obviously. But there are so many others. He's a desert lake. Every now and then, Cameron would find himself pausing, like at the back door of Devon's house, as a chill would run down his spine. In the peripheral of my vision, I saw that little spot on the left side of the screen at the edge of the beach up there. And I just, and <laughs> yeah. Because I was looking down at the text, in my periphery, it looked like a figure was standing on the shore over there. So I, I got real... I got real distracted in sentence for a second there looking up <laughs> at it. This is fascinating. I mean, it, it means that these abilities are just canonical in the setting now. Yeah. So this is well, the thing I, I was going to say earlier. The, one part of that I wanted to I'll save for a bit. But uh, obviously that thing that attached to him, we never got resolution on. And it's like, you know, at first I thought it was Sam thing from Echo, but it might just be the entity of Echo, right? And if Cameron brings that out of Echo and still maintains it, unlike someone like Chase, who, you know, his his possession weakened over time the further he was from Echo, that sets this game up as, like, very much widening the scope of this setting. In like a really interesting way, because uh, obviously so far the smoke room, Echo, and Arches have all taken place in this one town. But what happens when we kind of pull out the magnifying glass and, and get a bigger picture of this sort of supernatural world, this cosmic horror? When you go from up? The Shining to Doctor Sleep? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say. Is like, <laughs> you know. We, we are moving through the layers of the Dark Tower here and seeing more. There are more worlds than these, even. Um, and that, that kind of gets at something else, which is that very early in this story, um, I guess not really early in the story, about, at about the midway point when Cameron is talking to Devin telepathically, he says there's only two timelines in which they live. And in one of those timelines, Brian also lives. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what happened then, and if Cameron is going to chase that. In the, one where, in the one where everyone lives? Yeah, well, the one where he, he mentions, you know, Brian, Brian survives it too. And it, he says, like, in one of these timelines, Brian dies, and in another, he survives. Um... And I'm wondering if that's part of the terrible change itself. Because now he knows his hallucinations are real and he literally can see the future and even rewind. That's crazy. Well, if not rewind, rewind from his perspective. Yeah, he might have just seen the immediate future and reacted. Yeah. For just a moment, I'm like, they just fucking kill Cam. <laughs> I believed it for the moment. Like, it was just... Yeah. It was a horrible death, too. Yeah. Imagine the thing that I immediately jumped to was imagine tripping balls on shrooms being on the come down of already a pretty rough trip and then experiencing your own death, not ego death, literally watching and feeling yourself die only yeah. to then immediately warp back to the present. Like that must he, be I mean, that in and of itself is a he, huge change. He didn't just see his Cam. own death. He witnessed the, his own death from his the from the perspective of his loved one. Yeah, well, it, technically from the eyes of his murderer, which is crazy, right? Like, because he he's also experiencing what Brian is experiencing in that moment. So, because remember, at this point, Cam has no sense of self; he's completely yeah. disassociated. Which itself, it's funny because hopping between perspectives is just normal in fiction writing and, and like yeah. it's extremely common but it's way less common in visual novels and it's especially uncommon in echo project visual novels like these are pretty much every one i've ever heard of as far as i can tell all seem to be from one character's perspective for the entire run outside of weird visions 
So yeah. the one where you have a dissociating protagonist being the one where you also hop perspectives in the actual narrative is interesting. Yeah, that's really narratively potent. Yeah. And I think there's there's one other thing, not to get ahead of ourselves before the story has already ended, but like if you take this like addiction metaphor for all of this stuff and this like pur purpose seeking and addiction and magical thinking and all of these ideas put together, you know, this terrible change, it always meant an echo was attached to something somewhere nearby. This idea that like people carry their lingering trauma with them and Cam is one step away from a relapse every single minute now. Um, and what does that bring him to? Does that make him closer to Brian? Does that change him some way? Um, and even if you if you view that from a drugs perspective or this ESP perspective, how far is Cameron going to go into this when he understands this? This is his life now. That's that's really dark. That's a very grim place to to end up these characters with these narratives where something is so just viciously horrific that surviving them almost feels like a punishment yeah it always meant an echo was attached to something somewhere nearby that's what Cameron called the beings not exactly intelligent or even living but entities that interacted with and usually threatened the living. In that particular case, it emanated from under the back porch. When he told Devin about it, he knew immediately what Cameron was talking about. Oh yeah. I'd heard something moving under there all the time. Like a person crawling around. Even Dad says he saw red eyes under there once. But being more sensitive doesn't exactly answer questions, though. Like, why is it there? Where did it come from? What the hell is it? All he knows is that it's not a person. It never was a person. Because they're all demons. While Cameron had seen that old spark of interest in Devin's eyes, he had told Cameron to just ignore it and focus on their visit. Cameron can also tell that Devin just wants it to go away, quietly, like it never happened. All of it, including Cameron's abilities. That was at the end of the second week. And over the course of his life, Cameron would look back on that visit as one of the last times they were still themselves. Third typo. I didn't even recognize it. What was the typo? Time instead of times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's a trailer home in the Southwest. By the third week, Cameron was recovering at a remarkable rate, and so Devin began to pay Artie more visits and phone calls. His improvement was also rapid, but Cameron was just a little sad that Artie never asked to talk to him and would only ask Devin how the coyote was holding up. It made sense, he would tell himself. Devin and Artie go even further back than Devin and himself. Something felt off, but considering the circumstances, nothing was normal at the time. Actually, as the third week progressed, everything became wrong. Sometimes he'd wake up, whimpering or crying, thinking he was back in Echo. Devin had it far worse, waking up in a howling panic, yelling about guns, chains, and death. Those were the times when Cameron was the main one to comfort and give support, at least as best as his patched up and sore body could manage. But now, Cameron feels like part of him is missing, like he's not fully present. It's like pieces of him litter the town of his trauma. It still feels like he's there, in a way. And when that feeling really starts to set in, that's when it happened. A small pressure in his right ear starts to develop. It was something that he was sure had to do with the hearing loss he'd experienced from the shotgun blast. It was annoying, though. 
and I felt bizarre. They set up another appointment with Cameron's audiologist a, a few weeks from then. The hearing loss was likely permanent, but it was what began to replace it that bothered the coyote the most. In the middle of the afternoon, it happened. Did he get spikes beagled? I wonder. Mm. <laughs> Permanently stuck in the past? Yeah. That was part that was also part of the character's uh character from Doctor Sleep, wasn't it? Yep. Like he kind of never left the uh the, the overlook. It yeah. is the overlook hotel, yeah. I was like, hang on a minute, is that right? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> hmm. April twenty twenty. I wonder if that was the cliffhanger for like a year or whatever, however long it was between updates. Yeah, I wonder. Just leaving people there. And then it happened. <laughs> oh, God. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That'd be brutal. April, April 2020. Cameron starts working again that week. He wanted to feel useful again. And because they were both working from home now, it seemed like an okay idea. Devin didn't want any th didn't want him starting yet, of course, but Cameron wanted that sense of normalcy to come back, and his shitty job seemed like the perfect solution. Trying to work with mostly one paw did come as a bigger challenge than Cameron expected, not realizing how much he used his left. Typing was particularly slow, but he was getting better at managing. Still, it made him slow. And even though his boss was understanding, and even though, and, and even told him to just move forward, uh, and even told him to just forward rude customers her way, it still left him flustered in ways he wasn't used to. After a rather harsh call that began with, Thank God, someone I can finally fucking understand. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Call center during the pandemic sounds pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> just I'm, I'm just thinking of all the people I've dealt, dealt with that, like, feel the need to verbally complain out loud every time the, the fucking phone tree is like, press one for English. Like, I shouldn't fucking have to. This is America. <laughs> it's like, I yeah. do you want help or not, sir. Yeah, shut up and just let me let me solve yeah. your problem. You're complaining about it is not making it any faster. <coughs> then ah, I just choked on my water. <laughs> then ended with, you know what would have been faster? Cameron waits for the answer. Anything. This is the last time I buy some. Mm. Don't say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. No. Just got to gloss over that one. Phone made by some shit factory. Cameron rubs his eyes, wondering how different the interactions would be if they did video calls face to face. But sir, this phone was assembled in the States after Julian worked with the government in 2018 to bring more jobs to R. Transfer me, transfer me to your superior, please. Of course, one moment. As Cameron reaches for the button to his boss's line, he hears the man muttering under his breath. Mmm. <laughs> Didn't know they hired for customer service. Click. Click. <laughs> I can choose to say faggot all I want when it comes up in scripts. You can. That's my right. That's our <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> we have the F card. <laughs> uh, no big deal. He would get one of those every week. And according to his co-workers, it's gotten worse since the pandemic started. But why did that one hurt his feelings so badly, to the point that his eyes were welling with tears? Maybe it was because he went through hell and back, and that man has no idea. No idea. Then his computer screen seems to stretch far away, and Cameron found himself grabbing the edge of his desk like he's about to fall over. Pressure grows in his ear and he realizes that maybe it's causing the strange feeling of being off kilter. But no, he's tripping again. You know, I've heard of acid flashbacks, but I've never heard of shrooms flashbacks. I mean, granted, he was on a lot yeah. of shrooms, 
I'm not sure how much shrooms, how much psilocybin you can get in tea that small, but like, I mean, I guess he's a he's an esper, right? I can't hold it against him. <laughs> yeah. At first glance, until it was uh, clarified more, my first glance was the idea that like a building building in his ear. I thought he was getting like vertigo, like he has balance yeah. problems now. Yeah. Interesting. It's a flashback. Just a flashback. No, it's brain damage, and you'll probably feel like this forever. He poisoned you. And you are a fucking... Can't handle a literal customer stereotype? Just smash the keyboard. Just Sam sh <laughs> Uh, oh, Samsh, that's our fourth typo. You're yeah, right. Yeah, snuck in there. There have been some grammar mistakes, but the ty the actual typos have been relatively low. So good on them. Hopefully they'll watch this and see which ones they need to fix. <laughs> Cameron freezes, a paw up to his right ear, where the voice had come from. Is his headset still on, or...? No, and you can tell it's coming from inside your head, you idiot. After that, Cameron remembers a very, very little except panic. It was followed by confusion. A ton of confusion. His thoughts make no sense. The voice that is definitely not his thoughts doesn't make sense. And now he didn't understand where he is. The voice continues to encourage him to smash the keyboard. So he does, just to see if maybe it would break this bizarre half-dream. After finding, Sab after finding Cameron sobbing on the ground, surrounded by black, plastic keycaps, a frantic Devon drove him to the hospital. Maybe I'll stop if you grab the wheel and turn into the median. For old time's sake. And he doesn't even need a fucking fan. Look, Mom, no fans. The voice snickers. It continues to laugh at him all the way to the psychiatric ward. Hmm. October 2020. About seven months after Echo. And six months after his episode, Cameron feels even worse. The voice that had wormed its way into his damaged ear had disappeared after just a few days of antipsychotic treatment, but it returned again and again every few weeks. Short asides that were sometimes mean, sometimes meaningless, sometimes boring, annoying ass comments about things and people Cameron sees. It feels like it's trying to remind Cameron that things aren't okay, as weeks continued to come and go with manageable but clearly present psychotic symptoms. He had worried his broken arm would stop him from being able to play music as well as he used to. Turns out he needn't have worried at all, because he doesn't give a fuck anymore. Like a switch, his interests, his motivation, his want to do anything productive or useful seemed to just turn off. His mother said he needed meth because it fought the feelings of that, that her psychosis brought on, the latter of which was of course brought on by the meth. A vicious cycle. And speaking of cycles, he finally got his diagnosis. Schizophrenia, likely induced by the trauma and drug use in Echo. We knew that from the start, we called that. <laughs> Yeah. Not that it really matters what induced it, because the problem is that he has it. Does his uh, arm look any different? Not really. Behind the, the text thing, I'm wondering. Um, I don't he know. He doesn't how to have hide. that much scarring. I don't know how to hide face it. or anything. Let's see. Oh, you know, because you normally play on controller, right? Yeah. And a <laughs> controller right still, click maybe? still won't I work. Know. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, uh, interesting. Oops, nope. Yeah, I don't know how to hide text on on, on uh, 
desktop. There's no button for it on the screen. It yeah, must interesting. Be just some Renpy hotkey on on controller. It's Y. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, not that it matters. I was just I was wondering if he had like any more visible scarring or anything. But it seems like he actually made it out relatively okay. Yeah, or the fur covers it at least. Although Brian, although, yeah. yeah, all the other scars we've encountered do, don't work out that way. <clears throat> the irony of him having a cord shirt. Yeah, I wonder what chord that is. Yeah, I don't play I no idea. regular six string <clears throat> guitar. I don't know, no, at least not well enough to know chords very well. Not on site, at least. I'm getting just kind of like real life worried a little bit. Because the, uh, did I tell you what the update Patreon post said about this release when it was announced that it was going to come out soon? Like it's no. that, it's like Howley said that he was going through stuff in real life like he was going like he he went through some stuff in the last few months that's been hard oh, no <laughs> and that he wasn't going to that he was going to incorporate that into the ending of arches so i'm like what the fuck does that mean that's not there's no good interpretations there that's fucking rough yeah and then the additional detail was that like he ended up exploring themes in Arches that he meant to explore in Interia and Chemia, so he's going to rewrite those themes out of those games and, and go somewhere else with them. Which is also interesting. Just the mess of having to do these all in parallel, I guess. But, like, oh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm just like, this is a... <laughs> Distressing like I, place talked, to, like, yeah. pick up from. <laughs> like, I've talked about over-interpreting the narrative to be tied to the author, but when you say something like that, then I'm like, oh, no. Oh no. There's no there's no good interpretation of how that's going for him. If he's saying that that's incorporated into here. Yeah. Uh, uh, propanolo for restlessness. Propanolol. Propanolol. I don't know how to say any of these. <laughs> S-italopram. Trazodone. You can just read this. You can just read this page. Go for it. Yeah. Propranolol for restlessness. Escitalopram for depression. Trazodone for sleep and depression. Topiramate for weight control. Guafe uh, guanfacine for tics and PTSD. I thought it was guafenacine. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. For tics and PTSD. Tick. The symptoms of schizophrenia are devastating, but so are the side effects of the antipsychotics to treat it. Side effects, side effects that could be covered up by medications that caused even more side effects that were maybe more tolerable. The first antipsychotic he tried made him so tired they finally switched him after four months. Then, somehow, according to his last psychiatrist, the switch aggravated the dopamine in his brain, or something, and for some reason that meant his childhood motor and vocal tics got to come back. Not just come back, they came back with a vengeance, to the point where, the point that he got especially emotional, his neck and sometimes his body would go into an uncontrollable twitching fit. It made him feel like some kind of freak show in public, but when a vocal tick invol involving his diaphragm that he'd never had before made its appearance, he'd really started to despair. Is he just a woo in public now? I that would be more ideal, I imagine, than whatever he's <laughs> yeah. going through. It would force him to exhale for ten to fifteen seconds until he nearly blacked out. Oh, I know someone mm. who had a tick like this. He one of his ticks was like hi, like basically hyperventilating. Mm. Then it would release, and he would gasp in air again, only for it to happen half a dozen more times in agonizing, in agonizing waves. That familiar tightening in his abdomen, signaling an approaching episode was enough to make his whimper and wake him, make him whimper and dread. All because of that damn pill that was supposed to help him. Three or four of those episodes every day for a week, and Devon had finally had enough and found a different psychiatrist. His new psychiatrist switched him to another antipsychotic, one that she said would help his tics too. 
When Cameron had been readying himself to take his first dose, he broke down, and he had cried like a child. He even begged Devin not to make him take it, which just made the whole situation so much worse. What if it caused more problems to show up? Cameron read all about the horrible, lifelong side effects that antipsychotics can cause. Oh boy. Dyskinesia. Akathisia. Akathisia? I'm not sure. I, I actually don't know yeah. what that means. Dystonia. Catatonia. And his old childhood bane, Tourette Syndrome. This, do you want to start Googling these? That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Dyskinesia. Uh, uh, Akathisia is a neuropsychotic syndrome and movement disorder that makes it difficult to sit or remain still due to restlessness. It's kind of like restless leg syndrome, except it can be like all over your body. It can make you shiver. And probably most potently for Cameron, it is also a symptom of withdrawal. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Dystonia. I think this means he can't control like uh like the the usage of his like mu like not muscles but like his his m arms will like move rapidly basically like uh sometimes people with it will like not punch but like they'll like pull their arms in really close or they're like move their arms out really quick like it looks like they're trying to like shake their hands out and stuff um i'm not sure what dyskinesia is but my guess is let's google it is that it's a an issue with movement as well um, unusual movements that a person can't control. Again, it's like tremors or um, like tapping or, or, or things like that. Catatonia is just like obviously becoming catatonic, uh, not moving at all. And then obviously Tourette's is Tourette's. Man. <clears throat> I don't know what that is. Just throw the word tar dive in front of any of those and you have yourself a new disorder that will probably improve slightly over years but never go away. Oh, tar so yeah, tardive, tardive or tardive. I'm not sure. Tardive maybe is a, uh, it's like an issue that will crop up s randomly and then like progress to get worse and then get better but like never fully go away, it seems like. Hmm late occurring symptom and then there's always the worry that tolerance might build super sensitivity might set in and doses might need to be increased then he might develop a treatment resistant form of schizophrenia all from these little pills wreaking havoc on the synapses of his brain more poison more brain damage Cameron rubs his ear vigorously. You're the brain damage, asshole. Fuck you, you brain damaged piece of shit. Take the whole bottle. Remembering the management techniques his therapist taught him, Cameron takes a deep breath. Okay, time to take my medication. It's been a few weeks now. My ticks have decreased by over half, and I haven't had a breathing tick in four days. I feel like this is good progress. What think is? Positive symptoms have decreased by maybe 40% over the last week. Good progress. I just hope my negative symptoms improve as well. That's my next goal once I reach stability. His thoughts are his own again. And that makes Cameron feel at least a little bit better, knowing that some things are coming easier. He begins opening his pill organizer and pulls out the most important one. Despite tolerating palperidrone much better than the last antipsychotic, it still causes the same side effects to make him need to take the other meds. That make him need to take the other meds. At least it's making his tics better though he doubts they will ever truly go away like they did in his childhood. Tardive Tourette's. 
as the noise of pills rattling against their pl plastic sound through the kitchen. Cameron hears Dev in his study. <clears throat> oh, you taking it now? In just a sec. That was fast. Cameron mutters under his breath, feeling just a little resentful knowing that Devin had been listening in on his thinking out loud. Cameron sighs and picks up the pill again. Devin comes in with just his underwear on. A year ago it would have been a sight that Cameron would have appreciated. He probably would have put his arms around him and rub his face into his chest like he used to. But his sex drive was killed months ago, either from meds or from one of the many symptoms, and it's just another reminder that he's not who he used to be. While sex is the last thing on his mind, Cameron knows it's important in their relationship. He tried, and then he tried to pretend to enjoy it, but everything ached now, and he'd often just find himself staring at the ceiling. Devin suggested they wait until Cameron feels better which made Cameron feel worse. Devin's libido is stronger than Cameron's was, so he knows it must be sexually frustrating for the bear. Right now, the, De the Devin is just standing there, smiling pleasantly as he watches Cameron. Making sure you take your poison. A jolt of fear, a dip into unreality. I was just thinking out loud, if that's what you're wondering. Okay. It does seem to act up right before you take your meds. Did he said so he said that out loud. Yeah. Yeah, you know I don't need you to watch me anymore. It's quiet as Cameron swallows the pill, so Devin can see then follows it with the rest of the five or so medications. Right? Or do you still not trust me? I agree. But we'd also agreed that I'd do it for at least a year, just in case. Yeah, because you don't trust me. Cameron, uh, he's still like this. If anything, yeah. this is a sign that he's still the same person, which is frustrating yeah. on that level. Like he goes back and forth so rapidly. Spitefully, Cameron turns to show Devin the underside of his tongue. As if the bear might be suspicious he's hiding it. Cameron. You want to do a cavity search too? Hey, you know, maybe that can be our solution. I take my meds and you get to play with my ass. Cameron feels the burst of anger from Devin, and for some reason it feels good. That's kind of a fucked up thing to say. Is that what you think I even care about right now? Devin's yelling, and they're in a fight. I think it's kind of this, I mean, we've talked about this before, but like Howley's ability to make very realistic escalation in like domestic, not fights, but like arguments, is really interesting because like, in <laughs> I'm going to make like a comparison to like a bad person that probably shouldn't be used in this particular dynamic but like imagining that as like punchy Joss Whedon dialogue is like um. <laughs> you you could like imagine like a like the cute boyfriend like sarcastic boyfriend character being like fine I'll let you watch me take my pills and then you get to do a cavity search <laughs> and that would be like funny and like Sigh, charming roll the eyes yeah, exactly. Like, if I say funny and charming in the, like, kind of, oh, the characters are being catty assholes, but they, like, they like each other, so it's fine sort of way. But, like, Howley flips that on its head and, like, makes it truly venomous in a way that, yeah. like, hurts, you know? Like, it does he, seem like the kind of shitty, yeah. passive-aggressive thing someone would say in an argument like this. He managed to write the line, in exchange of what? Come? And it wasn't funny. It wasn't like a joke yeah. that we're supposed to that was supposed to lighten the mood. It was a sincere, vicious statement. Yeah. They're in a fight. The ones they never had before Echo. For a moment, Cameron wants Devin to hit him. Punch him right in the face, and everything as they know it. 
not much to lose anyway. But Devin will never do that. I talked shit on psychology before. I acted like I knew what it was about. But like you say, everyone changes. One of the things... I want you to get better. I'm not going to get better, Devin. This is permanent. It doesn't mean you can't get better. That's the point. And then I'll relapse. And then we help you get better again. I don't even care about that stupid voice anymore, or even the ticks. Tick. But it feels like my soul has been sucked out. And I don't know if it's the meds or the crazy or just me, but I hate it. I hate it too. I hate it so much. I hate that you feel this way. That's why I'm doing this. You don't even have a fucking clue what this is like. Everyone just talks about voices and hallucinations and delusions. But what about the cognitive shit? I can't think. Nothing feels real. And I feel dead. You're right. I don't. But you're all I think about every single minute of the day because I see you suffer and I want to stop it. I'm probably suffering because of the meds. And it's like back in college, but ten times worse. I can't write or even listen to music anymore. I don't want to do anything. That's the main thing. writing about... Is Howley writing about writer's block right now? Like, <laughs> writing about... Like, the, depression? Yeah. Yeah. About... Yeah. It's gotta be... It, just, it feels like it's gotta be incredibly rough to have expectations on you. To, like... I mean, I... Like, to, to develop an audience for something. And then yeah. have expectations and pressure on you. And then have to produce. No matter what... Like, despite anything that you have going on with you. Like, one of the things that's very comfy about Let's Plays is that I can just go. And I, I, I have this imposter syndrome that keeps me up at night sometimes where I think that I'm just gonna, like, wake up one day and forget how to do whatever the fuck made people like me in the first place, and I just won't be able to do it. But I have been able to just keep doing it for a decade now, so it's just not a very reasonable concern. But you go over to the other channel where it's like, okay, I'm, I need to write something and I need to produce something from scratch each time, and there is no, like, default filler thing that you can just do whenever something else of more productive or more interesting isn't happening. And, like, I, and in, in a way, I've had a... a I've, I've had, a, like, a thing going on, like, where... I can relate on some level, not... not I don't... Not the mental illness element, but, like, just the idea of, like... You've done, like, the big thing. The huge, structured, yeah. expected thing that was a huge project for a long period of time. And there's that feeling that it might be the most impactful thing you've ever done or will ever do. Like, if you if you make Echo and Ed Astra, it's hard to, like, go back and meet, keep making things afterwards and, be and like, yeah. have... Figure out what your new normal is or something. And, well, like, like I'm, when, like, I think about, like, I made that fucking... I spent like seven months on that Lego sheet video and there's a very and it's like its impact has been in yeah. like incomprehensible <laughs> and there's yeah, this element not just of like, to you but to other people as well yeah it's been fucking weird and yeah following up on that like I had the obvious at Astro thing that I was gonna I knew I was gonna do next but now that that's over I'm like scrambling to be like, what? What does a normal video even look like? Because they can't be like yeah. this. This can't happen. And it's again. not just. And I don't it's even not know even just what it expectations, looks like. right? Like it's not even just people saying like, oh, we want to see more from you. It's like, yeah. it's figuring it, they want to see more from you faster at the same quality or better, and you have to you have to mix that with like the things you have already said, the things you want to make and your ambitions at improvement over time. So like I let it's it, interesting seeing I Cameron a, here. and It's like I had a storm brewing for like 15 years in my mind and I fucking let it out in a three hour video and like, that's it. That's yeah, my, that's sometimes my, that's all you have to that's say. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> like I can make, yeah. like I always did and, and always will like enjoy media analysis and, analysis and discussing things and so on. But like that video is over. 
and won't happen again. Yeah. And I'll never do something like that again. And it's like, it's it, it it makes it very difficult to follow up on any real level. And it's like I can imagine like getting this point where it's like, okay, now you need to keep finding a new story, like after at Aster and Echo are over with. Yeah. You need to keep coming up with new things and have a point to it all. And this this this, this Build feeling that you have something to... so that it can be sustainable and yeah. so that you can make more stuff and like what happens after the thing you have to make after the thing you made and yeah like... And like you have this patreon following and you have this like need to like there's this feeling of like like how do you make it as important as those were before and impactful and affect people again that way and how do you have more yeah. of you left to show at some point how do you keep going yeah. with that stuff? It's like it's nightmarish. And it's yeah. like, well, I, th I think it's interesting looking at Cameron here in this context, right? Because there's obviously the addiction metaphor. There's the intertwining of addiction and finding purpose and finding satisfaction and having this like ESP, right? Like there's all these like spirit, metaphysical, spiritual, psycho, uh, psychoanalytical takes you can read from this. But like just from like the creative perspective, he's like an, he's like a music major who can't play music. He is someone who wished to communicate his story to people and couldn't. He's like a child who was neglected by his parents and now is neglecting. You know, I, I don't mean literally victim blaming him and saying like he's neglecting Devin, but like their relationship has a hole in it now that he can't fill and can't fill even if he wanted to. Um, and it's just like, again, that must be torture for, for him and reading that from the perspective of a creator and an artist it can be truly devastating to know to be able to see what is happening to your creative output and your communicative output yeah. and then just like not have the tools all to work on it is this concern of like not having like a default because like let's plays what like are such a comforting thing to be able to go back to whenever I'm not feeling creative or whatever or things aren't working out or or when it, or if I have a long stretch of not getting anything done I can at least be like well at least I have this thing that I'm keeping going and it's like let's plays are almost like the equivalent of like showing up to your like service industry job or like assembly line job like it's just like yeah there is just like it's not that these aren't jobs that require anything of you it's just that you can just go and you can just do it and there's yeah. being a creative is this kind of terrifying thing where you're only really a creative while you're creating and you can literally you can't just like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do this thing on those days and I'm going to write on those days and I'm going to like accomplish things on those days. But I'm just going to like sit down and just manifest the next thing. It's like you can literally clear out a week, to do nothing but write and then not write anything and it's like a deeply frustrating yeah. experience and whatever kind of compounding things are going on in your life that you can blame on for, the, for that outcome or what like what's causing that or like any kind of like relationship drama or mel mental illness or depression or just just the pandemic and having to create yeah. through the pandemic and everything like it's it doesn't like having things to, to discuss doesn't fix the problem where you just you can't just do the thing and if you're not actively doing the thing it's like how long how much time passes between the thing you're doing you, uh, how much time has to pass since the last thing you successfully created before you're no longer a creative you're just someone who did once create who created yeah, yeah. I, I wonder about that too and like and with regards to this i mean you bring up a you bring up an interesting point there where it's like in this case like your relationships might fail right or like the that when i say relationships i mean like the connections you forge with you know other creatives or, or things like that it's really easily mirrored between cameron and devin because cameron still clearly cares about devin but there's also an interesting aspect of cameron having looked into the future and having seen this and having known this was coming and you you get a bit of an arrival situation where it's like are is it worth living through the ending of things if you know they're going to end or you know you can see that block coming or you can see where this relationship is going to to fail 
Um, and it's, it's, it makes it's that line haunting from earlier where he said that Devin will continue, but he's not sure if he should. Yeah, no, can, exactly, exactly. And so you get that like creator dread, right? Or not even creative dread, but like the tortured sort of feeling that this this like artist has where he like he can't even do his day job that he resents at this point. Like not only were his own hobbies taken away from him, the very small things that gave him dignity in his life, which were like having a shitty call center job that helped him pay the bills so that he could be with his boyfriend. Like even that is taken away by this. And that's I don't know. That's dark. It's, and it, it, it kind of reflects upsetting. back on it reflects back on what you said about this being like like Howley having worked on or having gone through some stuff as he was working on this because it's like oh man what does that imply I hope he's doing okay yeah mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a uh, there's a hmm We're kind of breaking an agreement again, narratively. Like there is a promised catharsis in horror. Yeah. And we're refusing that. Like yeah. there is no like, oh, you found the good ending and here's your bittersweet ending where everyone moves on. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes Chase freaks out in the supermarket, but Kudzu's there to help him out or stuff like that. Like this is like, what if things don't get better? Yeah. And then that's just it. I I have this is a very weird tangent to go on and I'm not going to explain it super deeply. But <laughs> one of the reasons why I really like season 3 of Netflix's Castlevania animated series is because it takes place after they save the world. Yeah. And it's like like you saved the world, now you have to live in that. And like so few stories, even stories that are like about that concept, so rarely deal with the consequences of like saving a world or saving a person or getting through a traumatic event and then realizing that like life not only isn't as exciting in like a boring sense in, in the mundane sense of like adventure, um, not only is life not that exciting when you return to it, but like you're still returning to like kind of a shitty world that enabled that to happen to begin with. And it seems very much like that's boiling to this because this everything we're talking about right now. I don't know when this is going to air for the viewers, but like might be a few, you know, a, quite a few weeks after we first had those episodes. But like it's at right least, at the start it's of at the least story, June by now, maybe yeah, July. Exactly right. At the start of this story, you and I said oh no these people their relationship is founded on like some very rocky ground and it doesn't seem like they should be together it seems like it's heading towards disaster and like yeah saving each other and getting out of this trauma does not absolve that critical problem like th those issues existed before they went to echo yeah. And will continue existing after that. And, and a lot of analysis of, of Echo is about this idea that the protagonists, especially the party member, the, the, the actual like route characters like Leo, it's about this idea that they're that they have a fatal flaw that they've carried with them so far, and then they're gonna come out the other side of this horror having not gotten what they wanted, but learning a lesson and slowly moving on in a semi-realistic yeah. way. Like that's what ev that's every interpretation of Leo over and over again, especially when you're trying to like make up like when you're trying to explain him in like positive terms as like and like defend him throughout the thing is like this is this idea that he like will ultimately move on and have a more healthy outlook about relationships and not be what he was in Echo, especially in the in those routes. And this is essentially like yeah, but if you're mentally ill, you don't just learn your way out of what's wrong with you. Yeah, like, you, you don't still get have to, to You don't get that. to just have a cool adventure character arc and let the scars heal, and now it's better. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a reason why they call 
battling addiction being in recovery like you're never recovered you yeah you are constantly dealing with it um and so like it's just it it's really deeply tied in i think with the events that we've been seeing so far is just like of course this trauma wouldn't be resolved it, they're gonna have to deal with it forever in like in a really bad way yeah and i i just i don't have the best confidence in in people recovering from addiction just from experience and it's yeah. rough because yeah my, my dad was an alcoholic and like he he survived against all odds these insane outcomes where he was clearly going to die and seeing him nearly dead is what inspired the like hospital visits and so on that I wrote about in my annihilation essay like that was my that was me having a like a, a, just an actual like I was basically having like anxiety attacks as a result of seeing him suddenly just unrecognizable and then he just got better and then yeah. he kept drinking and now he's dead like addiction you don't I, I've, I've, I've seen too many instances of people just not learning and not changing and not getting better and not being able to defeat their addiction even when they literally go to the brink like it's not enough for some people yeah. and that's just well that's just interesting distressing. too because that that speaks to Brian's fatal flaw which was demonstrated earlier like Cameron says Brian is not evil because he's evil he's evil because he's selfish and he's not satisfied and like no amount of correction will fix that unless they can get over their need for a thing which will never happen or you learn to live with being unsatisfied which is like a very profoundly uh nuanced but also like tragic outcome i think Oh boy, <laughs> this is quite, yeah. this is a lot. And that's, I mean, and that's not even thinking about the people who do successfully live in recovery. Yeah. And like, and they'll even say like, yeah, like I'm successfully living in recovery and I lived to 95 and I'm on my deathbed, but like, I still want, you know, like I still want a Vicodin right now, or I want my Oxy, you know, like it never goes away. That's, it's just tragic. That's really sad. <laughs> That's the main peop that's the main reason people relapse. Positive symptoms go away. They think they're better. Then they stop their meds so the negative si so the negative symptoms aren't as bad and then they relapse. You need time, at a year at least, and maybe then we can start tapering off, but not now. And what if I relapse? It's like only half of schizophrenics that even achieve full 10-year remission medical literature he obsessed over pours out of his mouth then we'll try again right a burst of anxiety from Devin while Cameron never thought hard on the topic he does suppose he'd consider ending it if this is the rest of his life he's sure he will eventually but only if Dev isn't there to take that blow right Seeing and sensing Cameron back down, Devon lowers his guard as well before opening his arms in an invitation to hug. Despite his sore and sensitive skin, it feels good after the burst of anger and sadness. Remember, honey, one week at a time. I'm just sad. I'm sad because I had such a good life with you. And it feels like it was yesterday, but it's just gone now. You always talk about the new you. We'll have a new life. It'll just be a rough couple of years. Cameron mm, senses that's the not doubt encouraging. and worry in Devin's own mind. But this hug is enough to smother it for a moment. It's like weirdly dismissive a little bit. Like, I know what he means well, but being like, it'll just be a bad few years. Like, one says that Devin is like already 
under the impression that it is a bad time and that he has resigned himself to the fate that it will be bad for at least a couple years. But then it also sets him up for failure if the next few years after that aren't great either. That's tragic. <laughs> That's a, that was just not a good thing to say at that moment, I don't think. Perhaps just messaged me saying, hello, hope you're doing good. And I'm like, we're doing the end of Arches, so no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi haps and he says oh no <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah this is rough I think I sincerely believe that Dev knows that he's kind of lying and not that he gen not that he sincerely thinks like don't like I don't think he sincerely believes that this will just be a few years that he has to get through with Cameron and then it'll all be better and that's like what he's like hinging his hopes on or something but it's just like I think he needs he knows that he needs to let that hope live and like not just despair in the eternity of this because there's just no like purpose to that. Yeah. Like, I don't think he's like hinging. I don't think that his, him sticking around is dependent on the idea that it actually will only be a couple bad years. But yeah. it's still best to want that, basically. And yeah, we have this internal admission from Cameron that he's he doesn't he's not actively thinking about it, but he's it feels inevitable to him that he would commit suicide, but he couldn't do that to Devin. And so yeah. we see this dynamic where Devin keeps pulling him back. But again, he's dating his therapist. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's falling back into that original thing that we talked about before all of this horror, which is that that power dynamic in that relationship isn't healthy. It's like romantic in the writing sense of like, I'll keep living for you. But like in reality, that's a lot of pressure and a lot of baggage and is unhealthy to put on someone else. I don't even know what is healthy for Cameron at this at this point not having gone to silent hill to meet the ghosts mm. cameron senses the doubt and worry in devon's own mind but his hug is enough to smother it for a moment 